Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting human evolution research and sharing discoveries in programs like this. We want to thank Anne and Gordon Getty and Camilla and George Smith, whose generous support made this episode of Lunch Break Science possible. Here with us today is Leakey Foundation grant recipient, Chris Gilbert. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Chris is joining us from New York, where he is a professor of anthropology at Hunter College and is also a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. Chris searches for ancient primate fossils in neogene deposits of the Shivalik Hills in India and works on ape and monkey evolution in Africa. Chris also works on early primate evolution and their response to the early Eocene climactic optimum. I got, I got through it. <laughs> I did it, Chris, <laughs> in Wind River uh, Basin in Wyoming. Before we hear from Chris, for those of you watching us live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Leaky Foundation Live, you can post questions for Chris at any time in the chat, and Chris will answer them at the end of the episode. The earlier you get those questions in, the more likely Chris will be able to answer them. So Chris, you study quite a range of, when it comes to primate evolution. What primates do you focus on and over what range of time do you look at? Yeah, um, I find all of primate evolution really fascinating. So um, I've worked on everything from very early uh, fossil primates to some of the earliest true primates in the fossil record, all the way through I did my thesis on fossil monkeys in Africa. I work on uh, ape evolution uh, a, a bit in both Africa and Asia. And um, it really, the, all, of, all of primate and early human evolution, I, I think, is, is really interesting. So, um, you know, I, while I've focused a, a, a probably the, my most uh, amount of time on catarines, which are living oral monkeys and apes, um, you know, I, I really do find all of it fascinating and, and uh, like to, 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 to move around a little bit and, and study it, as much of, uh, of primate evolution uh, that, that I can. You know, why, why are fossil apes and monkeys so important? Yeah, well, you know, there's only so much you can learn by studying the living animals. And the only way you're going to be able to, you can come up with a hypothesis about how this or that happened during primate evolution. But the only way you're really going to know is to go look at the fossil record because the fossil record is really the ultimate documentation of evolution and evolutionary history. That's, that's where it, it tells you what, what happened. That's where you get actual evidence about what was being selected for and how anatomy has changed uh, and things like that. So it's the only it's the only way you can know anything about the timing and order of appearance of certain major groups. So major groups of primates, the only way you know when they really showed up for sure or you know or when. Um, and it, that's you have to go find them in the fossil record. The only way you're going to know when certain anatomical features first showed up and in what order is in the fossil record. So, for example, many people used to think that, for instance, in human evolution, big brains came before walking on two legs. And it, the fossil record clearly demonstrate that's that's incorrect. But the only way you could you could know that, you know, it was, was to disprove that was to find the fossils uh, that, that demonstrate that. Um, it's the only way you look at the fossil record is, is the only way you can really get a good handle on rates and patterns of, uh, of evolutionary change. So to know how fast or how slow different, um, you know, f uh, features evolved um, and the patterns of cladogenesis and anagenesis and, and things like that. It's the only place you're going to find some of these real, you know, when you have these seemingly uh, disparate groups where you say, well, and you're trying to figure out who's related to who, sometimes the only way you can really figure it out is to go to a fossil record and find these really key intermediate taxa that provide the anatomical link that, that allow you to, to figure out, oh, it's clear that this, this group is actually more closely related to this group because we have the intermediate fossil that, that demonstrates it uh, right there. And then lastly, I just mentioned that it's also the only place where you're gonna learn about uh, extinct primates and radiations that you could have never imagined even existed. Like th there used to be just w with just thousands of years ago, there used to be lemurs the size of gorillas that hung upside down from trees like sloths and things like that. And like, you would never, you would never imagine such a thing by going to Madagascar today, yeah. but we have uh, the fossils and, and we, we, we know that these, that these things happen. We know that primates used to be in North America. Of course they aren't here today and things like that. So the fossil record is really important, um, you know, to, to really get a true handle on, on evolutionary history. 
you make you you make it just sound so exciting. I, I know for those of us watching already kind of find it exciting, but you really um, summed it up really beautifully. Were you always interested? Yeah, how did you become interested in studying anthropology? Was it always something you were interested in, or? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I mean, I was I was always interested uh, in science. Um, I always loved um, biology and evolutionary biology in particular, and um, I was always interested. Uh, so I, when I went to go apply and um, was going to uh, university, I was going to Duke University and they had a freshman honors program where at the time where all of your classes you could apply to get into these little programs where all of your classes your first semester first year were were centered around one uh, area or topic of knowledge and I applied to the one that had to do with human evolution because I thought that sounds really cool you don't really study that in high school or anything like that and so I was like so I thought that would be that would be really cool so I got there and had you know amazing professors and um was just really found uh, all of my classes had to do with human evolution basically from from the day I stepped foot on campus and I, and I thought it was really fascinating I, I just sort of kept kept going with it rather than um, my, my original plan I was gonna I was gonna go be an environmental lawyer at one one point in my life Ooh. and then I, I said I said once I took all these courses I said you know I'm, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do uh, this this human evolution primate evolution thing what was your first research project yeah so um, at Duke for my senior thesis, my, my first real sort of independent research project is um, I did a little project out of the, the, so at Duke, they have the largest collection of strepsiron primates outside of Madagascar. This is the Duke Lemur Center. You're seeing some pictures on your screen of it right now. And uh, I went out there for my senior year and I chased around these, these little ring-tailed lemurs. I, I chased these guys around and was studying their, their behavior, or studying their, their post, their post conflict uh, behavior and looking for evidence of reconciliation. So in these guys, I was watching it, the, the females are dominant. And so oftentimes the, the females, either females get a fight or female, usually, usually be a male would come up and some female would just whack him and, and he'd run off and then, and then come back and try, you know, it was a question of whether or not they, they tried to come, come back and make up um, and sort of give a submissive call and do some grooming or something like that to sort of make up the relationship, which is something that's well documented in other primates. Um, this is something that, that the many different primates do, but it, it, but it wasn't really documented in lemur. So it would, that was that was my, my my senior thesis, a little primate behavior lemur behavior project that I that I did out at the at the lemur center. It was the primate center at the time, and um, yeah. So so that 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 was that was my first real sort of. Uh, each sort of independent research project was actually was actually at one point in my life you know I, yeah I was gonna be I was gonna go chase lemurs or uh, go chase monkeys uh, for a living. So I mean, and you're you're not chasing lemurs <laughs> no. anymore. So when did the paleontology bug bite you? Yeah, I mean, so that's how, I mean when I was when I was a real little kid, you know, um, I think like a lot of little kids, I thought dinosaurs were like the coolest thing ever. And so I used to make my make my parents check out every dinosaur book in the library, like like over and over again. Um, so I always I always liked paleontology. And when I also when I was at Duke, I had was the very fortunate, really an amazing uh, um, at the time, the biological anthropology and anatomy department, now the evolutionary anthropology department, but an amazing department down there. And um, I, you know, so I took a bunch of classes from Dr. Elwin Simons, who is one of the um, real, you know, big figures in primate evolution um, for, for, for many, many years. And so so I it sort of had been exposed to primate and human evolution through through those classes. And I was like, and I always thought that, that was amazing. Um, and then when I got to graduate school, I sort sort of slowly drifted away from the from the primate and lemur behavior into and I said, you know what, I, I really think that the, the paleontology, this is this is really what what I think I, I, I want I want to really focus on for the for my career. What, you know, what, when you got started in paleontology work, was it more in the field or in the lab? How, how, what were your first projects? Yeah, so I mean, I, it was it was a little bit of both. I mean, so you know, like I said, I first took to the class at Duke, so it was exposed to to the the major, um, you know, a lot of the major groups and, and but when I got to graduate school my first paleontological experience first time actually getting out and picking up a fossil was actually I made it out to the to the Fayum I, I, I was uh, with Dr. Simons and Eric Seifert uh, and their whole research team um, and the Fayum is just one of the most amazing places you're ever going to find for for fossils and for mammalian evolution in the late Eocene through early Ligocene in particular when we were looking at amazing diversity of fossil primates and other fossil mammals as well so it was really uh, quite amazing experience first 
real paleontological experience. Here I am uh, finding, I think, my first fossil primate, a uh, li little part of a, yeah, part of a, a, a couple teeth, I think, of, of an animal called Catapithecus. Um, and so, so yeah, after after that, I was like, you know, thought this is this is amazing. I also made it out to Montana um, and and did some field work with with my my roommate and friend at the time, Doug Doug Boyer, uh, who's now actually a professor at Duke, but um, and John Block, who's at Florida, and and Mary Silcox and the, the, their whole group. Um, in any case, and then you know, sort of just, just kept going with it. For my thesis, I actually ended up doing a lot of work in the museum. So, I mean, you know, paleontology is in all just field work. There's a lot of fossils that have already been collected and that need to be worked on that are sitting in museums. So much of my thesis was going back and looking at all these fossil monkeys that had been collected many years ago, but hadn't been um, studied in a number of years and, and um, is trying to make sense of sense of them in light of sort of new understanding of, of, uh, of monkey anatomy and evolution. And then um, I also I should yeah sorry I should, should also do that. and then my, my uh, I also you know did, did field work and then after my my thesis in in Kenya with 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 Andrew Hill and, and his team and then of course we started our project uh, doing more field work at, in, in India which is which is where we're working um, now you see here this is this is at, at a place called Ramnagar we have our ongoing field field project which I'll I'll talk a little bit more about in the the mini lecture but we've been uh, very fortunate to find a couple of really interesting uh, new primates uh, around this area as, as well so so really I've, I've been able to do both sort of uh, field and and lab work um, in order to study paleontology and primate ev evolution over over the course of my career this is the, these are all shots of, of us at Ramnagar where we found some um, fossil apes and as well as some some new fossil um, other fossil primates that, that, that as I said I'll, I'll sort of talk about so what are some of the other well, projects that you're working on now I know we'll, we'll you know as you mentioned we'll hear more about India later which I'm really excited about yeah yeah um so we're also working um i have uh i've been been working with um for example with with with, with isaiah nango's team i think i think you, you're having him on in, in a in a couple of weeks or, or something like that yeah, but uh yeah 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 great so I, I was uh i was very fortunate to be a part of the team looking uh looking at it niazapithecus Alessi. so uh, working on that a little bit in addition to looking at um at, at, at Remnagar. Also, I have just ongoing interest because I did my thesis on fossil monkeys. I have just an ongoing project where we are revising and we're actually working on a, a still working um, on this large edited volume on fossil monkey evolution in Africa. So I'm, I'm still sort of very interested in African primate evolution um, and up through, through early hominins and, and do work with, with folks on various fossils from, from Africa as well. We also have, as you mentioned, um, we're just sort of getting going and, and trying to uh, get funding to to work on early primate evolution in um, North America. We're, we're interested in the response of primates and other mammals to the early Eocene climatic optimum. And so <clears throat> myself, Russ Secord in Nebraska, um, yeah, this is the Wind River Basin. You see um, this is an area called Buck Springs where a lot of uh, really neat uh, fossil primate skulls of, of little uh, Omamaya primates, little possible, tar possible Tarsi relatives called Shoshonius has been found there. We found a lot of interesting fossils we've been able to bring back to the American Museum of Natural History. And this is an ongoing project with myself, Stephen Chester, Ross Secord, Amy Chu. Um, and so so that's, that's you know, uh, a, lot, um, a lot of fun and we're, we're sort of moving forward with that project and hopefully we'll we'll get some things um you know uh, published on, on that soon as well it must be so neat to get to work with um so many different fossils from different areas and get to actually do field work in different areas as well and you've found quite a number of fossils do you have a favorite fossil um yeah that's that's a, that's a good question I, you know uh I, I would say you know there's there's a few that come to mind that that were pretty cool to to, to find you know probably the first one that, that I could think of and it's because it's the first one that I found that that I had that aha moment during my thesis when I, when I named it I opened was working on my thesis I was at uh, at the University of the Witz Ron, so Witz and I opened up this drawer they used to keep all the fossil monkeys in these these just file cabinet drawers and I opened up this drawer and I, in the back in the back corner I saw this skull. Um, 
And yeah, this is this is it right here. This specimen. And as soon as I saw it, I had spent so much time in the American Museum of Natural History, in the Smithsonian, in the British Museum, staring at all of these papillon and monkeys. And as soon as I saw this thing, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is this this looks exactly like this uh, this group called Circasibus mangabees." And uh, I realized pretty quickly. And then I looked back at my notes and I realized all the other things that that that, that were supposed to be in this uh, in the associated with this fossil, they all look, looked like as well. So it was, it was the first fossil I ended up actually naming and placing into a new genus. So it was the first thing that you know I. I found a name. I can remember coming back and, and telling my, my friend who I was staying with at the time in, in Johannesburg about it. He was like, yeah, great. That's, that's great. You found a, a dead monkey in a drawer. Thanks. Yeah, that, like, you know, <laughs> I was excited about it, but, but other people were at the time, but anyway, it was, it was, um, so, so, so that was cool. And then, and then uh, probably cool things I've found in the field. Um, when I was in, in the Fayum uh, one year, I, I was out there and I actually found part of the skull of, of Egyptopithecus, most of the frontal. Yeah, so the top of the skull. So this is the top of the orbits and it had the, the whole sagittal crest, the whole frontal trigon and things like that. And and that that's pretty cool because Egyptopithecus is a very iconic uh, fossil primate. So to find a, a part of a skull of one, that was that was cool. And then uh, the last one, which, which I'll talk about more in our talk, will, will be actually the, the, the fossil tooth, tooth that, that uh, is is the earliest given in the fossil record, which which is this uh, a genus of species we just found named Capi remnigarensis, which um, which 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 I which I happened to, which, which I happened to be hiking up the hill I, we found back in 2015, uh, and when we found it, you know, we knew it was something cool right away. Um, and we spent the, the next five years, we just published it this year. So we spent five years working on it um, just to make sure uh, we, we were able to you know, describe it and um, document it correctly. But, but when we found it, it was pretty clear it was a, it was a new ape. And you don't find new ape, a new fossil ape species uh, every day. So that was, that was pretty cool. This is all of us uh, you know, in, in, in India when we, when we found um, some of these fossils. Yeah. What? I'm really excited now to hear your talk. We'll dig deeper into primate evolution and turn the virtual flow over to you, Chris. Okay, all right, let me get the screen share thing going. Hopefully this will work this time. Yeah, it, um, it, with the truth, it's so small. I mean, I, I, how did you, How was it because it was shiny that it, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, um, yes. It, it was. I just saw uh, just a little piece of the enamel, a little shiny piece of because the, the they're also stained pretty dark as as you as you saw from the pictures. Um, but yeah, I was able to uh, just you just see a little glint. Uh, you know, you see a little shine, and I just sort of ca caught my eye and was able to reach down and, and pick it up. And um, yeah, so that was that was pretty cool. So okay. yeah, so I, I'll just go ahead and, and and tell just talk a little bit more about our ongoing project then on primate evolution biogeography in the Indian Lower Shivaliks. And this project actually started about 10 years ago now when my colleagues John Flegel and Rajiv Panayak had a grant to go look at, at a site in India called Mirzapur to go look for more fossil monkeys. Um, Mirzapur is a site that's about a million years old. And it's very interesting because there's one fossil monkey that's found from there, and it's placed in a genus and species called Therapithecus oswaldi. And uh, Therapithecus oswaldi is a giant relative of the living gelata. Living gelatas are found uh, today only found in the Ethiopian in the Ethiopian highlands. And, but in the fossil record, they were very common, found all throughout Africa. And then there are these couple very interesting specimens, like this one from Mirzapur, that is outside of Africa. So this is one of the very few specimens of Therapithecus documented outside of Africa. But it means that these giant geladas got all the way over to India at one point. So it's very interesting from a, a biogeographic point of view, point of view of, of monkey evolution. So we went to go look for more of it. And when we got to this to this to the site of Mirzapur. Uh, we found that they just built a dam here recently. So we got there and we were looking down at this water everywhere. And since fossils don't float very well, and we didn't really have scuba gear to go looking for fossils at the bottom of the lake, we realized we we're going to have to go find fossils somewhere else. So Rajiv had the idea that he had always wanted to go to this place up north called Ramnagar, which was known to have uh, fossil primates and fossil apes for, for many years, but he'd never been. And so Biran Patel, myself, and Rajiv, we all hopped in the car. We went, uh, started down here near Chenagar and drove all the way up uh, to north to Ramnagar. Ramnagar, from a geological point of view, has always been um, understood to be 
correlated with the Chinji Formation, a well-defined uh, geological unit over in Pakistan that's about 14 to 11 million years old. We're trying to get a better, more precise estimate of exactly how old the sediments are at Ramnagar. We think maybe they're closer to 12 and a half to 13 and a half, but that's ongoing work that we're trying to sort out. Um, and that's with Chris Campuzano, ASU, and then uh, Rajiv Patnaik and their graduate students. So as I mentioned, fossil apes have been known at Ramnagar for almost 100 years. The first ape was discovered in 1922. It's uh, a genus and species called Shivapithecus indicus that is known from there. And Shivapithecus is uh, long been, it's a well-known, uh, it's an actually an early Asian great ape. It's a well-known relative of the living orangutan. And since we've been working there, we've, we've, our, our research team has been fortunate to up to find a couple of specimens as well. Um, apes are very rare in the Shivaliks. They've always been very rare in the Shivaliks. But if you look long enough, you will find uh, fossil apes. And so we found at least a, a couple teeth and maybe a couple of other specimens as well. But well, what I want to focus on for the rest of the talk is not Shivapithecus, which we already know a fair amount about, but the new fossil primates that we've been finding. So even though Ramnagar has been worked at on and off for 100 years, we're still finding new fossil primates there. And that's, and that's exciting and that's really interesting. So if we Look at Ramnagar. I'm going to pull out this inset over here. Here's the satellite imagery. If you go south, south, southeast of Ramnagar, you come to a place we're calling Sunatair, which have two different, we're naming two different localities, sort of at the top and bottom of a hill, Sunatair 1 and 2. At the bottom of the hill, this is what Sunatair 1 looks like. Fossils are, this is actually a year we went and it had snowed recently. Um, in any case, uh, is at the bottom of a hill, there's fossils that are eroding out of a pseudo conglomerate. It's between two major uh, massive sandstones. And uh, on a nice clear day, you can see the Himalayas in the background, which is, which is really pretty. You walk up the hill, and this is where we found both of our new fossil primates, and that is at Sunatair 2. Uh, there's Dr. Camposano over there for scale. But um, this is, you see it's heavily vegetated, but where things are exposed, you will find fossils. Um, there, there are some fossils there. In 2014, my colleague Primjit Singh found this beautiful little jaw. And this is an interesting uh, uh, interesting primate known as a Shivladapid. It's got, you see all three molars are preserved and actually the roots of the fourth premolar are there as well. It was a really nice specimen. Um, and Shivladapids are part of this broader radiation of very early primates called the uh, adapids or adipoids. They're actually some of the very first true primates to show up in the fossil record, starting at the very beginning of the Eocene about 56 million years ago. They're early strepsorines. They're, they're early relatives of lemurs, lorises, and galagos that are alive today. Um, and they go extinct uh, most places uh, around the world, except for in Asia, some of these adapids, the shival adapids, um, persist up up until all the way up until about six million years ago so so they were they were lemur relatives basically running around um asia up until till, till about six million years ago so we found this specimen uh we knew it was a shivalidapid which was really interesting we compared it with all known shivalidapids and we realized that the thing that we had was something that hadn't been documented before um first of all i've i've blown these up to be the same size but our specimen is on the right shivalidapis a uh, different specimen of different genus is on the is on the left, but our specimen is about half the size of Shivalatopus and also is very different in terms of its uh, its anatomy. So one thing you notice over here, for example, is that Shivalatopus has this really strong shelf that's on the cheek side of the of the jaw of the, of the teeth, and our specimen doesn't really have that. Even though that the teeth are worn, it it should be there. Um, and it's and it's not. So it's it's something that was it's was clearly different. We named it a new genus and species. We called it Ramatopus sanii. It just helps to document the the diversity of this radiation of, of early primates. Up uh, Shivalidapids weren't even recognized until 40 years ago, and now, as you see on the screen, there's a number of different genera and species that are now recognized, and this sort of adds to our knowledge and diversity of that group. Uh, it seems to be closely related to other Shivalidapids like Indraloris and Shivalatopus. The next year, we found the specimen we were just talking about, uh, which which is this, this little uh, fossil Gibbon, um, and that is, this is in 2015, I was hiking up this hill, and I, I stopped, I sat down for a second, looked to, to my right, saw this shiny little piece of enamel, and sort of a quick dug around it, and popped it, popped this out, popped out this little tooth. 
And as soon as we found it, we were pretty excited because we knew it wasn't a Shiva Dapid or a monkey. Uh, and we knew it wasn't Shiva Pithecus. It was, it was much smaller than Shiva Pithecus. It was something that was about the size of a gibbon. And when we looked at it, you know, I had been actually looking at gibbons um, recently in the, in the American Museum of Natural History. And it just struck me, it, it kind of looks like, kind of looks like a gibbon. Um, and gibbons, for if, in just to just to take back up a, a, for a second, gibbons are also known as the lesser apes. These are the the, the apes that uh, brachiate hand over hand and go flying through the trees, and they're the most speciose gr a group of of living apes. But they have virtually no fossil record. Uh, we know that they diverged from great apes about 20 million years ago, but up until now, there's been no fossils known of of uh, gibbons until about six or seven million years ago. So when we found this, and we knew it was around 13 million years ago, we said, "Well, the skeptic in me said, well, wait a second. What's what's the odds that we actually found the earliest fossil gibbon?" I thought that it would it was probably much more likely that it, it was something else. And there's a known group of fossil primates also known from Eurasia at this time called pliopithecoids. They're actually primitive catarines are more primitive than living oral monkeys and apes, but they're about gibbon sized. And some, sometimes uh, some of their teeth have been mistaken for gibbons in the past. So I thought, well, we're gonna have to compare it to these things and, and figure out what, what this, what, what this tooth is. So we did. We spent the next five years doing uh, doing our homework and comparing our specimen very closely with with all these other known fossil primates of the same age, same uh, same general um, time period. These are pliopithecoids you see everywhere. Here's our tooth. Um, pliopithecoids, it turns out, are very distinctive in their anatomy. They look nothing like uh, like a gibbon or like our tooth. Um, first of all, you'll see that they have these really big singular these really big shelves on the outside of the of the of the tooth and ours only has a little bit of a shelf it's it's clearly reduced which is more derived and more similar to what you see in, in living ape teeth also you'll notice that the the cusps uh on the cheek side or buckle side are more anterior than than on the opposite side they're basically offset and our cusps, and this is what uh, living um, apes look like, are transverse, they're directly across from each other. They're not, they're not offset like this at all. Um, you could also notice that the cusp in the back here, the hypochondylid, is over in, on, the, on the cheek side of the tooth in all these pliopithecoids, where it is in our fossil, it's much closer to the center of the tooth. And then finally, you also notice that all these pliopithecoid um, genera have a bunch of cresting going on in the middle of the of the of the tooth itself. And in fact, there's the series of crests that form a triangle on the uh, on the buccal side of the tooth. And if you look at our tooth, it's it's a wide open basin in the middle. The cusps are placed around the outside. And there's no hint of any cresting at all. And so what what we're able to convince ourselves pretty quickly is that this this really is some sort of uh, ape, um, and it, and we did some further analyses. Um, this is this is uh, with my with my research team that I'll I'll talk about. But this is a lot of work by Alejandro Ortiz and and, and Kelsey Pugh and and some others. But we did uh, a two D geometric uh, morphometric analysis of of all these these teeth, uh, including our fossil. But what you see highlighted in green here are all the living gibbons, all the living giving gibbon species in genera. And then all these other colors are all the fossil groups of early apes and pliopithecoids and things like that that are of the same size and, and you know, uh, that this thing could possibly be. You'll see our specimen highlighted in the red falls completely within in a multivariate analysis, completely with, within the envelope of, uh, of living gibbons and nowhere near um, any of these 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 fossil uh groups so we became pretty convinced that this is indeed and we just published this in the proceedings of royal society b that this is indeed um the earliest known given in the fossil record we named it kapi which is hindi for a uh, ape or monkey and its importance we think is it really as i was mentioning you know given Evolution is this is a sort of black hole. Is this huge mystery in primate evolution and ape evolution, um, and that is, you know, wh where are the fossil gibbons? We know that know that they they separated from great apes about 20 million years ago, and then they show up in in China around six or seven million years ago. Where are they in between? When did they get to Asia? Um, you know, what happened in given evolution? And so this this specimen, I think, is starting, you know, to, to help fill in some of some of those questions. And in that gap, it is uh, it is showing you that gibbons were in Asia by 13 million years ago. 
Um, it's obviously right smack in the middle in terms of, of the geography. So we also think that it's also giving you some sort of idea of um, possibly, you know, when they got there. And it also happens to be the same time that great apes got there. And also anatomically, it is very intermediate between very early apes and what you see in modern gibbons. So it, it really fits in a lot of ways. Of, it's a very intermediate uh, taxon, I think, really is, is documenting um uh, gibbons as they're dispersing out of Africa and getting over uh, into into East and Southeast Asia. So with that, I'll just stop. I want to just acknowledge the, the Leakey Foundation and our other um, funders for our project. I want to thank my, and just mention all of my, my research team, our research team, which is with Biran Patel, Rajiv Panayak, Chris Camposano, Kelsey Pugh, Kathleen Rust, uh, Alejandro Ortiz, Primjit Singh, and John Flegel, and all the other people for their help and advice. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions if, if we uh, have a few minutes here. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, sure. As you mentioned, we'll, we'll now be taking the questions. So if you have not submitted your questions yet, please get them into the chat now. Um, Chris, I have an initial question for you, though. If you yeah. could find any fossil to help you fill in the fossil record, what would you want to uncover? Yeah, I, I, I'd want I'd want more of 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 Capi, uh, to, to be honest with you. I mean, there's a lot of you know, it is about as convincing as uh, as as a tooth you could find for it being a tooth. But I, I would like to know more. Uh, like I said, there's there's virtually nothing known about about Gibbon evolution, so it's very tantalizing. You'd like to know something about, for instance, as I mentioned, Gibbons have that very um, distinctive way of moving around the, the brachiation, the hand over hand, uh, it, you know, but without post cranium, without any sort of skeleton, we don't know when that evolved. We don't know if, for instance, was copy already moving around like that, or was it, was it moving around something different? Um, so, and, and that would answer other questions in ape evolution as well. Cause some people think that suspensory locomotion, it, you know, is uh, evolved once and all, all living apes uh, had the common ancestor, had suspensory locomotion. Others believe that gibbons evolved suspensory locomotion independent of great apes and, and, and other things. So there's a lot of questions that, that, that could be answered if we had uh, more skeleton. Also, you know, we would we'd like to know what the what the what the skull and what the face looked like too. Oh, I I, I bet it, there's something about a skull that you know you just really have a connection with. We'll take yeah. our first audience question now. Uh -huh. What is a typical day like working in the field? Uh, very good question. In the field in, in India, um, yeah, it's it's pretty much you you, you get up, you, you have you have your your quick breakfast and your coffee, and you, you get out to the to to the to the outcrops as 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 quickly as you can, and and we just we typically just bring um, whatever little lunch with us, and we just kind of are out there looking for fossils from you know, as, as early as we can get out there until it starts to get dark. Um, so, it, you know, they can be long days, but in general, if you like being outside and hiking around, it's, it's usually, I, 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 I enjoy it, but yeah, that's, that, that's, I mean, that's a, a, a typical day and it depends on where you are in India. Um, you know, we, we, we actually have a local, uh, a, a guest house, um, that they were able to stay at, but, but we're not, um, um, but we're not uh, in other places you you and we camp out so it, it depends in terms of, of 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 how that works so so different different places we do we do different things as far as accommodation but but that's that's what a typical day is, is out is, is just you you get up and, and get going as, as early as you can and as long as there's light you know then there's there's a chance to find fossils you don't find many fossils in the dark so while it's light out you just you just get out there and and, and look as as long as you can our next question is coming from, let's see here. Ah, what makes a gibbon different from other monkeys? Oh, uh, interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, good, good question. Um, gibbons, gibbons are, are uh, apes. They're, they're, they're known as the, the lesser apes. And, um, you know, again, part of what, what they're highly suspensory. They have uh, very long arms relative to, to, to the, to, to their legs. Uh, there's a number of features that, that, um, makes them distinctive, many of which are actually in, in the, the, the skeleton that are associated with, with brachiating, with their, with their way of moving around in, in the trees. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, dental features, which we were able to document that, that, uh, that are, that are, you know, not, 
um, we could get real technical, but 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 basically there there are a number of subtle dental differences that separate gibbons from from earlier uh, catarines and, and earlier primates as well, um, and you have to be, be be very careful to 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 pick up on them, but 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 they are there as well. So so you can look for just very uh, distinctive uh, features in the in the teeth, and then the postcranial skeleton in in particular um, distinguishes gibbons anatomically from from other um, other apes and other primates. Do we have another question? Let's see here. An anonymous viewer asks, what is the early <laughs> climactic optimum and how did it impact primate evolution? Thank you, anonymous. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> that, so that is, uh, so that is, the early Eocene climatic optimum is uh, actually the warmest time period over the past uh, 66 million years since the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, so there's uh, there's a there's a there's a there's a climatic event right at the so the, when the dinosaurs go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, the the next epoch is called the Paleocene. At the very end of the Paleocene, there's a temperature spike called the Paleo Paleocene Eocene thermal ma maximum. Um, so that, that that the temperature goes way up, but it comes right back down. It's a real just quick spike. And then a, as the early Eocene starts, the temperature rises all the way through the early Eocene and reaches its peak, and that is the early Eocene climatic optimum. And that's global temperatures, so that you could find, um, you know, you could find uh, mammals like the, the like. Uh, Primates and uh, early sort of primate relatives are found in the Arctic Circle uh, during during some of these temperatures. It's it's so warm. So I mean, the, the whole Western United States at this time is basically tropical forest. But uh, so what 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 we are interested in though is the the finer details of of this. How was this this climatic warming event, and then the the, the cooling on the other side. What exactly is happening in primate and mammalian evolution uh, during this time period? We know that that there's that they are diversifying in terms of number of species, but a bigger question is how are all of these groups of mammals and primates actually evolved? Like, are they drastically changing their their niches and their niche niche space uh, during this time? Um, what are you know what are yeah what are their locomotor responses and how do do they differ? Uh, potentially in different forest structures. So different basins, different different fossiliferous areas are preserving slightly different forests. So are primates in one forest responding the same or different to primates in another uh, you know, forest that perhaps is, is not quite as tropical as maybe a little bit more seasonal or something like that? Are, are, is the response basically the same it, 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 during this big temperatures, um, you know, long temperature event? Or do they differ between between areas and, and and things like that so so that's what that's what what we're interested uh in, in looking at and um and studying further and so that that that's you know we're just sort of getting getting started with that but that's that's the the general idea of things that, that, that we're interested out in the western united states we have time for one last question how has COVID affected your research and your students research Yes, uh, very, very uh, pertinent question. Um, it has it has affected it, you know, quite a bit. I mean, um, it basically can't go to museums, can't go anywhere right now. So we have the very unfortunate, you know, I feel really bad for any sort of graduate students that are in the position right now where they're just kind of sitting waiting and they can't go do their thesis because they can't travel. Uh, so many, uh, you know, I'm sure this is a problem for, for many leaky grantees and NSF grantees and, and winter grant grantees and everybody, but it's really hard to be able to go do your thesis uh, right now because because you, you really can't go anywhere. So it's it's similar for, for me too. you know, I like I couldn't go to the field this past summer. Obviously, I, I we just got a big grant um, from from NSF, the National Science Foundation. Uh, we aren't able I'm not able to go out to India until, of course, this is all over. So it's it's greatly impacted in particular field work. Um, you know, it has definitely impacted, you, we're all teaching from home here at CUNY. So, so, um, you know, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm not, I'm not in my office. I haven't been in my office since March. Um, and yeah, so the, the, what, what I would say, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough that I'm in a position where, um, where I've collected enough data over enough, enough years at this point that I still have things I can work on, uh, you know, so I can, there, there's still, still stuff to do, but, but, but anything that requires me actually collecting any new data, 
kind of stuck for right now. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a big bummer, but, but like I said, I, I feel, I feel much worse. I feel much less bad for me. I feel much worse for, for students and people who are in the, you know, time range when they really need to be, be, be getting out and they're kind of just stuck in limbo here. That's, that's where it's, it's, it's been most difficult. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I really can't, I can't even imagine. Um, but Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. This was such a really wonderful episode. Just thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, so, that, happy oh, to do it. Sorry. <laughs> um, you can visit us at leakyfoundation.org to learn more about the Leaky Foundation, Chris Gilbert, as well as how you can help support research like his and educational programs like Lunch Break Science. Right now, all donations will be doubled by two generous donors, meaning your impact will be doubled. On November 19th, just two weeks from today, we meet Leaky Foundation scientist Jacinta Beener and learn about her work studying gelato monkeys in the Simian Mountains of Ethiopia. Be sure to subscribe to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about upcoming episodes, as well as groundbreaking discoveries in human evolution research. Still hungry for science and can't wait until November 19th? Check out the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast, Origin Stories. Our latest episode features Leaky Foundation grantee Nina Jablonski discussing the evolution of human skin color and how color-based race concepts have impacted social well-being. Origin Stories is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Lunch Break Science is made possible by the generous support of Anna Gordon Getty and Camilla and George Smith. Thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, stay hungry for knowledge. <laughs>